on today's episode of Why is there an empty spot in a storage lot? Another Yamaha gets its chance at revival. So after a long period of procrastination, the old Bravo gets its turn in the shop. Waiting for most of the mice to try and migrate out of there. Hey, why don't you get down there and get them mice? So there was mouse nests basically everywhere. Looks like they was under the seat, which decided to disconnect itself from the sled. See if anything gets out of here before we throw it in the shop. So we got another Yamaha in the shop. Now this has been in storage for a little while, and it's actually in surprisingly good shape. Well, by my standards anyways. It might have been sitting in Project Purgatory for a while, but it had a nice warm spot with a cover and everything. So we got to evict all the vermin out of there and see what we got to work with. I think the cats were, well, they were at least giving it a shot at keeping the mice out. Found out that the seat really wasn't, well, there was almost no plywood left underneath there. It pretty much disintegrated when you looked at it wrong. Got a little bit of corrosion going from the mouse house down in there. And a little bit more under the tunnel, but no gaping rust holes that you can pitch a baseball through. Like a rock. Now this is not the normal type of sled that ends up finding its way into the shop. Little 250 single banger. It looks like somebody swapped in the wrong length track and suspension. But after riding a few of these in the past, I got a newfound appreciation for lightness. They're just a fun little sled to beat around on. This sled ended up coming with another batch of parts. Of course, you always try and get a better deal when you buy in bulk. And the guy that had it, he was pretty cool, and I believe he was the original owner of this. Bought it back in the day, and him and then his kids just kind of played around in the yard and the fields, and that was about all the use that it got. Spent a lot of time just sitting in the shed out of the elements. So yeah, sometimes you go out trying to find a couple of old Scorpion parts. You end up coming home with a Yamaha Bravo. It happens. So being in pretty nice shape overall, we actually did try and keep this thing in decent enough storage to, you know, maintain it. It wasn't going to sit out in the weather and rot away or nothing. But I think there's finally a need for a nice little lightweight, fuel-efficient, ice-fishing type sled. This would do just the job. I mean, I've used the old Thundercat as an ice fishing sled, and it'll do the job. Definitely hard on the gas, though. And you gotta have, like, 28 inches of ice, too, to support the weight. Probably a good chance there's some more mice down in the air box. Already gave this whole thing the compressed air bath once, and there's still remnants of, well, mouse debris everywhere. I mean, at first glance, this thing is way better than I'm used to working on. Albeit, I think it's probably not run in a solid 10, maybe even 15 years. Not really sure. Those fuel lines are petrified solid. Being that the sled's actually pretty solid overall, we might do a few cosmetic things, like painting the tunnel and skis. Now, now don't worry. Don't get used to that. Gonna try and save that vinyl because we don't really want to make a brand new seat cover. Gonna have to do something about that plywood though. It does roll over and there's uh, well it sounds like there's nuts falling out of the fan shroud. I actually don't see much in the tank which is hopefully a good thing. Now, I was really impressed by the condition of the track. I mean, there might be a couple of weather checks here and there, but that track is soft and factory fresh. You can see most of the factory hardware is even in good shape. Gotta love them old stickers. Oh man, there's a crack. Might as well part it out. And a scratch, too. 
This thing's basically totaled. So it's a little over a week later and been delayed actually trying to work on this thing. Now you can see by that shine there, we're trying to revive the seat cover with a mixture of PB blaster, automatic transmission fluid, at least one layer WD-40, and some old vinyl restore. Now I don't know if any one of these in particular is going to work better than the other, but we've just been throwing them all on there in an attempt to make something work. And there is some snow and cold in the forecast, so got to try and get this thing mobile. Been in the shop way too long, taking up all that floor space. So since the engine is the heart of any sled, and the most important part, we're going to start by taking the skis off and painting those. You got to try for at least 30 seconds to get that old cotter pin out of the bolt. After that, you just put the impact on it and shear it clean. I mean, even I will spring for that point oh 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 two cents per cotter pin. Well, for as light as this entire sled is, those skis are surprisingly heavy. If you could come up with a nice lightweight plastic conversion for those, make that thing even easier to throw into the bed of a truck. Although you could probably just let them sit in the dirt for about 5 or 10 years, and the rust would do a pretty good job of lighting them in as well. Here in the paint booth now, giving these skis a fresh premium coat of paint. You want some of that mildew on there. It helps absorb the paint and creates a protective barrier. Sort of like bed liner. Can of paint's empty. So that means this job is done. Can't go more than one 99 cent can of spray paint on these. All right, now that we got the critical details finished, we can move on to the remaining. First job is going to be cleaning that air box. And it almost appears that it may just have that inlet there bolted onto a substructure that is also bolted to the frame. Why do sled manufacturers have to make the air boxes such a pain to remove? I mean, it's not like you never have to remove them for service or anything. Yeah, hopefully we can just remove that part there, get in with the shop vac. Clutches look pretty decent. Got the normal rust on there from storing it with the belt on. Belt looks pretty new. That's a score. A couple of the bolts from that shroud don't look factory. Somebody's been in there before. And you can see from that amount of corrosion on the front of the cylinder, uh, I'd bet good money there's a mouse nest inside there as well. Taking a little bit more time doing it right, cleaning all this stuff out of here before you even try to fire it. A lot better than sucking an acorn into the engine. Gonna have to pull the exhaust and check that as well. And it also seems like sleds that once they get infested with mice, the mice must smell it and they just keep coming back. Once you've had an infestation, it seems very tough to keep the mice out of it in the off season. The exhaust came off without any dog food falling out of it. This whole loop of fuel line for your gauge sight back there, that may have to get emitted because Tigon fuel line is expensive. The main fuel line, that's rock hard, so that's got to get replaced. Got to be careful to not break that plastic barb down there. So that piston looks sort of alright. But if you look up towards the top left, there is a chip missing right off the crown. Kind of hard to see. And I have no clue how it got there. Don't see any damage around the squish band where stuff was kind of getting smashed between the head. The rings are still free, so they're not froze up, so it didn't crush the crown of the piston and smash the rings. What the heck, Yamaha? You can still see all the honing marks in the cylinder. Not many hours on it. So we're going to do the proper thing 
and just rewind and erase the last five minutes of events that we've learned and pretend like we're all good to go. I mean, just one little piece of piston being gone. Well, it's just a lightweight racing model now. Eh, yeah, not too bad. Oh yeah, it's everywhere. Shop back's been working overtime on this job. Nothing crazy in the back portion of the air box. A couple things in the carb though. Seems like there was a little bit of debris sitting down there at the butterfly, but don't believe anything major got down into the engine. Hopefully. Got some excavating to do. Not bad at all. Gives me hope that maybe this thing was actually ran dry of fuel before it was stored. A little bit of gelling going on there. Yeah, no corrosion on the jets. We'll give everything a, a quick cleaning. Throw her back together. Always keep track of your air screw settings. It's all spick and span now. There was a surprising amount of dirt lodged in all the internal passages. Now I had to take off the oil injection line to take the carb off. And you can see there, it was actually already splitting when I pulled off the little metal retainer to take this line off. That's slightly concerning. We're going to replace the line for now, as much as it pains me to actually still use oil injection. But this thing being such low mileage, we're going to mix the gas already and then run it until we can confirm that the oil injection is actually working. And then we'll decide if we disable it or not. It's not the right size fuel line, but it's close enough. Now the oil ratio for this thing, we're going to run 40 to 1. 40 to 1. It's always great when you find survivors like this that have been kept in climate controlled storage. Even the rubber tether doesn't have any cracks in the rubber. So when you're always trying to keep old junk running and try and keep it somewhat reliable, part of that's definitely preventative maintenance. And that's also trying to anticipate any of the wear items and possible issues and failures that might come up. Even simple stuff like fuel lines. Once they get hard, or if you see a wiring connection that's a bit weak, maybe not quite... Uh, sealed up it could be susceptible to corrosion maybe there's a wire or a hose that looks like it's going to rub through on something sharp keeping an eye out and finding those small things that'll end up putting you on the side of the trail or the road well those make the difference between what's reliable and not so unless it's just something fun you're beating around in the fields or the back roads if you look at something and you think ah that's not quite right don't just ignore it there's a good chance you might have to replace it well, we thought the gas tank was empty. Found out it wasn't. Now we've got rancid dinosaur tar leaking all over the garage. One of the downfalls of the Bravo motor, as compared to like the old ET250, is the cylinder and the head are a one-piece design. You're not changing head gaskets or shaving the head to get some extra compression there. Sure, it's no performance engine, but still kind of odd seeing designs like that. The old OMC opposed twins were actually like that too. I also think that the later year Bravos had a decompression release on there. No such thing on the first year model here. Might as well see if there's anything good in the uh, toolbox. Hopefully there's no mouse nests in here. Oh, looks like your basic kit. Well, no hundred dollar bills. So you see the brand new plug in there. Always got to double check. Yep, she's been used. Nothing like being stranded out in the wilderness, going to get your spare spark plug, and finding out that it's already been pre-fouled. Oh, that thing's only half fouled. Back in the box she goes. We'll let future me worry about that. So we're down on the underside looking at the suspension. 
trying to find any grease fittings and thus far we're really striking out I mean uh, I'm sure you'll probably let me know of all the ones I'm missing but I don't see any so we're probably just gonna spray it down with some uh, some WD-40 or a little bit better penetrating oil and call it a day still just amazed at how soft and pliable the track is things like the snow flap well some of the bearings might not be the happiest but we'll run it a little bit and see if they free up all right gave the whole rear suspension a WD-40 restoration should be good there probably ought to check to see if there's any oil left in that chain case Now the mice did a number on that one. So on the original seat, the wire here for the taillight went up and underneath the plywood in between the foam and the plywood. I don't think you need to do that. We're basically going to omit this connector here since there's really no wiring left to splice onto and just set that wire straight underneath the seat. Now as much as I would really like to just duct tape that whole seat directly onto here, I think might actually try and replace the plywood and do it the right way. Eh, don't worry about it. Nobody's ever going to see that anyways. The only reason I didn't use wire nuts is because they wouldn't fit underneath the plywood. Trying to get the new fuel line wove through that little port through the bulkhead in between a bunch of wires and then up to the fuel pump there. That ain't happening. We're just going to take the direct route up over the top into the fuel pump. And we'll say that's for serviceability. Also, don't understand why they used bolted connections for the belt guard instead of a pin. Got all the fuel lines sorted out. Still don't have the seat quite finished yet. But this thing is close enough to try and get it running. So, I'm going to go throw some premixed gas in it and see if it'll light off. It's getting thrown out of the shop anyways right now. We got to work on the oval sled. All right, we primed the fuel system. Let's see what happens. Smells like an outboard because, well, that's the old gas that we had. You can actually see the oil is very, very slowly starting to come up into the carb. Kind of concerned about that a little bit. Hopefully we can watch that move.
Alright, so now we're working on removing all the old plywood from the seat and getting tetanus in the process. A little bit of rust bacteria won't hurt you. Well, you got the obligatory stink bugs. Got some really thin plywood cut up here. You don't have to worry about straight edges. And probably going to go through all this work only to have that seat cover disintegrate next season. Might just be my imagination, but after spraying the inside as well, it definitely seems to be getting a little bit softer. That's pretty much factory. Really thought there'd be a better way to attach the front of the seat. But we're going to end up reusing these crusty old brackets. The ones here at the back, well, they're just too far gone. Maybe just drill through and use one of those expanding drywall anchors or something. Was going to repaint the top of the tunnel there. But we're just going to hit it with some fluid film and call it a day. So at the moment, we're just going straight up through the tunnel with these sheet metal screws, they're the same as plywood screws, right into the bottom of the seat. Definitely not the proper way, but it's working. Plus you got gravity also always holding it down. And if the seat comes loose coming out of turn two, well, they make duct tape for that. So that whole seat could have turned into a massive time sink of just waiting on parts new seat covers, making a seat cover, trying to do everything right, get the right little clips. In this case, just getting it done was as important as getting it done right. Windshield's got a weak spot and we were just moments away from drilling and riveting that thing back together. But at the last second, looked under the hood, they actually used bolts to hold it on. mint and believe it or not I mean I must have the restoration Rona we actually got the trim for the round the outside of the windshield I mean main reason is it's already starting to crack and if we don't put it on there well that whole windshield is just going to become multi-piece well don't get your hopes up too much we might end up holding this on with zip ties it should have came that way from the factory. Had one defect up here, but a little bit of RTV and some tape. That'll set up all right. Yeah, this bottle of wax is like 10 years old, so you know things don't often get a shine around here. Well, except maybe that kind of shine. A little bit of steel wool and WD-40 even brought the handlebar chrome around. That's about as clean as that's ever going to be. Trying to keep stuff nice and shiny, that just brings on anxiety. Oh. Under the hood just got a splash of WD-40 and well, that was about it. Kind of looks good. Well, you might be able to tell from the lack of snow. But this thing has not seen any riding yet this season. Certainly been one of the worst winters I can remember. Looks like things are just going to have to wait until we either get a freak snowstorm or start again next season.